Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Emmanuel Dinge Antonio, I'm the director of the Blood and Transplant Research Unit for uh, Donors Health and Genomics. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here for this uh, our seminar series. So to, today we have a fantastic speaker, so Mart Janssen. So Mart uh, is studying medical engineering at the, the medical at the university in, in Eindhoven, and then moved to the university university medical center in Utrecht where you know, he worked around medical technology assessment. And now he's working since 2004 at the Sankrin, the blood transfusion service in, in the Netherlands. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Matt, and to have you speaking about the, the optimal red cell matching strategy. And please, uh, as we all know now, uh, we are online. So please keep your um, microphone muted and then we'll have time for uh, question to Matt at the end of the at the end of the talk. Matt, up to you. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, trying to get my presentation online. So you all should be seeing that right now, I think. Yes, perfect. Thanks. Okay, great. So then I'll, I'll kick off. So um, yeah, welcome everybody. I, it was really nice to see some familiar faces. Some of my colleagues even are even joining. So um, yeah, uh, my talk is going to be about optimal red blood cell matching strategies. And that is something that we have been uh, working on uh, the last couple of years. So um, I'm very happy that Immanuel asked me to give a presentation for this uh, on this seminar. Um, so um, let's kick off. Um, let's see if this is working. Yeah, it's working. So. Like Emmanuel said, I've been a uh, principal investigator for uh, for the transfusion technology assessment department uh, of Sanquin, and uh, I've been doing that for about ten years now. And uh, basically, that means what what I do is I try and uh, develop statistical or mathematical models to to support decision making. And I, initially, I kicked off um, looking at uh, the transmission of infectious diseases. But more and more uh, things have changed in the last, like I said, the last couple of years, I've been mainly involved in the logistics side. So I run a very small department of primarily PhD students that work in different areas. So um, I've got two people working on the, the extended red blood cell matching. I've got um, one uh, PhD student working on meta modeling, which means that we're trying to capture the information in the data instead of working with the data itself. And that should make it easier to, 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 to migrate data uh, and share data. Uh, we've got Marika who's working on uh, prediction of donor outcomes and uh, Sheldy who's working on scenario analysis, trying to see what critical factors there are for the future of the, of the blood supply. So it's a very diverse uh, uh, area of research, I think, but that also makes it uh, extremely interesting. So the, uh, the outline of my talk, uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the context of the blood supply in the Netherlands and then uh, go into uh, different stages of modeling and, and, and the types of models that we have, uh, have applied in the past and hopefully uh, will be applying in the future. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the drawbacks of these models and approaches and, and see if we can do better and what we, what we intend to be doing to, to um, uh, to create to create better operating uh, systems. So Sanquin was established in 1989, and uh, we were based in Amsterdam. And if you look at the Dutch blood supply, we've got like uh, around about 400,000 donors uh, who do 736,000 donations in 2020. Uh, which the, the, the majority were whole blood donations and um, we've got about 130 uh, donation centers and about 3,000 employees. Now, if you look at the, the blood transfusion policy in the Netherlands, we have a guideline that, that prescribes ex more extended matching for uh, specific patient groups, so for patient subgroups. And I've, I've indicated here what, uh, what this guideline in the Netherlands um, suggests. But as, we, as, as you are probably more aware of than, uh, and, more, and more knowledgeable about than, uh, than myself, is that it's possible to, uh, to determine these uh, um, genotypes of various uh, red blood cells by looking at the DNA profile. 
this is a really nice publication from 2018, which describes this, um, this uh, the capability of this genotyping approach in finding uh, in, in how that performs it compare in comparison to serological typing, which is what we are currently doing for quite a large number of donors. And obviously, as the as the the cost of genotyping uh, is coming down rapidly, um, the question popped up, well, if, if we can do this genotyping and we can do that for our donors and potentially also for, uh, for a lot of uh, recipients in future, um, that should really mean that it should be feasible uh, to match on many, many more antigens in, in future. On the... Um, on the uh, the counter side of that, because that's 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 an opportunity. But the the, the the question that immediately pops up, if you think about it, is is that is that is that a real is that realistic to be expecting that we can do a proper job if we would try and match for multiple antigens in practice? And the reason behind that is, as as you all know, with the increase of the number of antigens that you consider. Uh, the number of different products that you have in stock really explodes. So for five antigens, you can figure, calculate that the number of different products that you can distinguish is 32. But if you go to 15 antigens and also take into account some of the uh, dependencies between some of these antigens, um, it turns out that you, you get into the tens of thousands of different products, which obviously makes a... Um, um, the management of a uh, di very diverse stock uh, extremely com complicated. So what I want to focus on in this talk is, is basically on the complete right end. So I want to, want to look at what, that's basically what we have been focusing on so far, is looking at if, if you'd have a hospital stock, how, how do you manage requests from different patients? And obviously, um, when you look at matching of blood or of, of red blood cells, we all know that there is this dependency on um, on uh, the blood types for which red blood cells you can actually uh, transfuse to different recipients, and it's dependent on the on the the, the, uh, the genotypes for uh, sorry the, the the antigens of these various. Uh, of the red blood cells of, of donor and recipient. And this is a, a matching table which tells you that obviously O negative is the universal uh, donor blood type and AB positive is the universal recipient blood type. So there is this strong dependency between the usability of particular uh, red blood cells. And hence it is as one could, ex as could be expected, uh, in the donor population, which is indicated on the, with the, the, the darker colored graphs, what you can see is obviously that there is a big, in the donor population, there's a, a, a big overrepresentation of O negative uh, blood cells. Now, take, if you take these numbers and look at the probability that, uh, that a particular product would be in, in an inventory of a particular size, so say you'd have an inventory of the size of 80 products, the likelihood that you'd have an AB negative product in stock uh, would be like 40%. So if you would want to match identical blood products, um, for instance, you would have to have quite a substantial size stock to be sure that you'd have an AB negative product in stock. And hence, this compatibility makes life a lot easier. Because you can see that that uh, even for O negative, for uh, uh, an inventory of size 80, you'd be quite confident that you'd, you'd actually have an O negative blood type in stock. So this making use of this compatibility uh, makes life a lot easier for providing the right blood, uh, a compatible blood, a matching blood product for a, for a, a particular recipient. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do this, uh, this same sort of exercise um, for the whole scale of these 18,000 uh, different blood types that I've uh, referred to earlier, you can plot the, uh, the occurrence frequency versus receivability and usability. And receivability, we define as the likelihood that there is a product that is compatible, right? So here you'd have 
uh, a product with a likelihood of one in a million probability of occurrence. And you can see that, um, that, uh, that the likelihood that there is a product in stock that is uh, that can be used to match this particular request is quite a lot larger, right? So, so you can see that th that would probably be somewhere in the range or very within the range of 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus second, maybe. But you can also see that there for some products, um, this, can, this exact matching is required because the, the occurrence frequency um, is almost the same or is the same as the occurrence frequency of the receivability. That means that there is no margin in terms of that the like that it's more likely to have a product that actually matches than that there is a product that doesn't match. And that is obviously the case for those products that have a lot of negative antigens, because a whole range of negative antigens reduces the likelihood that there is a product that is matched that can be matched. On the other hand, you also can also look at the at the at the, at the, the usability, and that's the likelihood that a product can actually be used for compatible matching. And there, obviously, there's something similar going on. So these products cl close to this line are the, the 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 products that are highly positive because they can only be used for recipients that have uh, that are positive on all these. Uh, all these antigens as well. What is interesting is that um, that this receivability and usability, as you can see in this graph, is about on average two logs higher than the occurrence frequency of a particular blood uh, red blood cell itself. So that means that there, that indeed in this compatible matching, there in general is a lot of room for finding products that you can actually match. Now, looking at the um, um, at, at the matchability is obviously one thing you 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 would want to um, um, uh, take into account when you want to match uh, blood products from inventory to particular requests uh, from the from within within the clinic. Um, but the second thing thing you would really want to consider is in case you you, you cannot match on a particular antigen. What is the impact of that, uh, that that mismatch? So, in that sense, you would also want to take into account the the immunogenicity, which uh, which is the likelihood that actually uh, antibodies will uh, will develop given that you actually uh, mismatch on that particular antigen. And Sylvia Avers has published a nice paper in uh, in Lancet Immunology in 2016, in which she describes a cohort of 20,000. Uh, transfusion recipients that had not been transfused before, and she looked at the development of antibodies in this in this cohort. And derived from that study, uh, we can define a relative immunogenicity, which is the the, the relative likelihood that a uh, a particular antigen would uh, would would result in the uh, uh, production of antibodies within a transfusion recipient. And this is obviously something you would want to take into account when matching red blood cells. Now, if we would have an, an, an infinite inventory, um, that we, we would, there would really be no problem because whatever the request is, um, you would be certain that you'd have a, an identical product in your inventory. And if that's, which I've indicated now, they are, um, um, become a bit lighter, which means that these products have been handed out. And for the next request, you would just, because you have a very large inventory, you can um, uh, be sure that you have identical products remaining in your, uh, in your inventory. And um, so you would not expect there to be any problems because at a certain stage, those earlier, uh, handed out products will be replenished in your inventory. So um, um, this is a sort of an ideal situation where you can envision that once this inventory grows, the problems become smaller. And, um, but the reverse is also true, that for smaller inventories, it gets more and more difficult to 
um, to assess which products to link to which products from inventory to link to a particular request. And one of the things that complicates that obviously is that uh, that that there are many many different ways in which you can link a um, uh, a particular request to products in a in a in a current inventory. So what is what is optimal in that sense? And well, a first a first way on uh, a first the, the first really the first way we looked at this problem is uh, we said well you know what what can you expect to be able to produce given that you have a particular inventory? So we did some calculations at which we said, well, let's say that this inventory is a reflection of the donor population. And we say that it's static, that it sort of remains the same, which is really presuming that your inventory is, uh, is, 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 um, um, is ideal really. So you presume that every product that that you hand out will be replaced immediately with a similar product. And you can just calculate the probability of being able to, to comply with particular requests. And you can do that for various sizes of inventory and for various numbers of products. And if you do that, you can see that, that actually, um, um, as can be expected, because this immunogenicity is also quite variable that um, let me first explain on uh, what you see in this graph. Here you see the proportion of, on the y-axis, you see the proportion of alloimmunization prevented. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, you see the number of antigens that is matched for. So if you match on 12 antigens and you have an inventory of size 60 and you request one product, on average, there will be like a 95% probability that you can actually you can actually find a compatible product to match that particular request. Uh, and what you see is that this number is as this number of antigens reduces, so you match, you try and match for lesser and lesser uh, antigens, that obviously the proportion of aluminization pre prevented will reduce. But you can also see that even if you only match for five or six, that you're that the uh, six antigens, you're you're, you're do already doing pretty well. What's also clear is that you request multiple items from this inventory, it gets more difficult to comply. And what also plays a role, of course, is the order in which you, you would uh, try and select these antigens. So you would definitely want to have the most immunogenic antigens first to get the highest impact in terms of uh, alloimmunization prevented. Now, if you change the size, for instance, from, from 60 to 250, so if you, if you increase the size of your in inventory, uh, you see that the, uh, that the, the, the proportion of alloimmunization prevented will go up dr dramatically. So it's worthwhile working on, on larger scale. Well, one of the problems with this approach, obviously, is that it's quite, it's a sort of a theoretical probability, right? It's a, it's a reflection of an ideal inventory, and it just calculates the, 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 the probability of having a, uh, 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 a matching product available. And obviously, these estimates are, are too positive when you take into account that you don't have a, a, a static inventory because the inventory is determined by what comes in, which is a random, uh, 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 a random process, and what goes out, which is determined by the decisions that you make in terms of which product you match to which, uh, which product you have in stock. And um, just to illustrate that that complicates uh, the situation, I've given this, uh, this sort of uh, ideal picture of an, uh, a particular red blood cell that comes in at a particular fixed frequency. So if you imagine that this would, for instance, be a probability of one, one in 10 products would have this particular composition, then that in an ideal world that look, would look like this. But in, real, in reality, um, the, the 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 frequency at which this product will will come into your inventory will vary. So the the time between uh, the the addition of this specific product will will vary, which means that if you need that particular product, say at the end of this particular interval, 
you'd see that for the first interval, you'd have two products, but for the next, you'd have one, and for the third, you'd have zero. And this is the situation where you don't want to be in. So this stochasticity definitely influences the availability of your blood products. Well, the way to do that is, and to calculate the impact of doing that, is by doing an, uh, a, dyna a, dy uh, a dynamic assessment. Uh, you, 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 um, the easiest way to do that is just to do a simulation. So basically, you play the game of uh, managing an inventory, and uh, you look at the requests, you match your products that, that are being taken out of your inventory, and there's a replenishment of your inventory. Uh, and what you'll find is that if you um, match compatible products, um, what will happen is that your, uh, easy, your uh, products with a high usability will go out of your inventory first, and you'll end up with a, um, with a stockpiling of those products that have a bad usability. And that will mean that at a certain stage, you'll run out of stock. And, uh, and you run out of the capability of providing matching, matching products. So, and, and, and a very easy way to, uh, to prevent that from happening is to, um, is to match products identically on as many antigens as the inventory allows, but in a fixed order. So that is just a decision rule that you can, uh, can apply to your inventory that will prevent um, um, the, the the piling of basically uh, difficult to match products, uh, and if you do a simulation uh, on that basis, you can see that, for instance, this is for a static matching. It's a similar situation as I described before for an inventory of two hundred fifty, um, but then for um, for um, um, uh, an identical matching strategy, you can work out that this is the probability of being able to provide uh, a matching product for a given amount of products that you that you request. But you can see that there is quite an impact of um, of the um, of a stochastic supply. So you can see that the the the, the proportion of aluminization prevented um, uh, goes down substantially by incorporating this. Um, uh, this dynamic behavior of the inventory. So then we ask ourselves, well, this is not an ideal situation. This is not something that you would probably do and because um, you do overcome this problem of uh, the deprivation of your, uh, of your inventory, um, but you, you are not exploiting the potential of uh, compatible matching. And as I've shown before, we know that there is a a tremendous uh, um, opportunity there, so it makes life a lot easier if you if you're not that restricted. So, um, so what can you do? And um, the way to um, to uh, to overcome that is well, you can think about what a best match given a particular inventory would be. Um, and you can work towards that by just just balancing um, the the impact of uh, the matching strategy that you propose. So if you'd look at your inventory, and uh, you'd say, well, the, the um, we don't want to lose the the usability of the blood products that we hand out. That basically translates to minimize the loss of. Um, um, uh, uh, a, for instance, AVOD compatibility, and that basically translates to minimizing the loss of usability of the products that you hand out. So you'd rather match an A positive blood cell to an AB positive uh, uh, blood cell uh, that's being requested rather than to use the O positive. And that means that you want to, that translates to uh, to the desire to minimize the loss of usability. Uh, and that makes complete sense because you want to, to keep this, uh, this flexibility of these products that you have in inventory as much as possible. 
And you would only want to do this if you don't have an AB positive. Also, you only want to do this if you don't have a positive um, uh, rat cells in your inventory at the moment of request. So, and by doing that, you uh, you definitely uh, work towards an efficient use of the capability of the inventory that you have at the present at, at the moment that you get a particular request for red blood cells. The second objective you would want to you would want to achieve is you would want to minimize the risk of antibody formation formation on minor antigens. So, if you do have to if you do have to mismatch minor antigens, you would want to do that such that the immunogenicity of those antigens that you mismatch uh, are minimal. And a third point you would want to have to take into account is that you want to be less strict on these first two rules above once a product get old, gets older because you would have you will have to uh, uh, match these more difficult to match products at some stage so this makes it makes sense to incorporate these three aspects into some kind of penalty function and that will give you um, uh, a penalty based matching of products so basically what you do is you Calculate this penalty for uh, for each of the products that you have in, in, in inventory, given a number of products that are being requested from this inventory, and you minimize the match between those products um, that has the lowest penalty. More formally, that would look like this. So this is a way in which you can make that formal and also make it in, 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 write it down in such a way that you can code it and solve this problem. But where basically what you see here is those terms that I was describing just now, that shortage basically refers to the fact that you do want to match all the requests that come, come into uh, that, that that come into the uh, that are being you what you you want to have a matching product for all those red cells that request a mass a matching product you want to uh, give a penalty for the uh, the mismatch on uh, on antigens you reduce this penalty depending on the age of the product that you hand out you penalize the uh, the antigen uh, the major antigen substitution so that is the difference between the usability of the product that you that you match with the product that's being requested and um, and so the larger that gap in usability the higher the penalty and you want to penalize the minor antigen substitution. For this analysis, um, we also said that we would want to use, uh, not look at different levels of um, units requested, but that we really wanted to uh, give a proper reflection of the RBC units actually transferred or requested for patients in hospitals. And we had a, a, a substantial size database with, uh, with actual requests from within hospitals, within I think six or seven hospitals. And we looked at the distribution of requests and basically we decided to use um, only, I think only one, two, three, and four. So the distribution of one, two, two, three, and four products in our simulations. And if you run these simulations, what you'll see is that, um, that you can actually, even for a very small inventory size, you can reduce the number of, uh, of alloimmunizations um, compared to the um, matching these products on ABOD alone, you can reduce that likelihood by 80%. So, uh, so that's quite substantial, even for a, for a very small inventory. I'm sorry, yeah. This, so this is this is the uh, this is the number of products per day. So that's in this case 25, and an inventory of 125. 
But what you can also see is if this if this if battery goes up, you can achieve a higher reduction of the uh, the alloy immunization, the level of alloy immunization. So this was basically the main result of the paper that we uh, we published uh, last year in uh, in Fox. And uh, the second major graph in this paper was this one, where we show that for this actual uh, simulation, what the reduction in the number of um, mismatches per specific antigen. And here you can see that indeed for uh, for Kel and E and uh, uh, and hit, there is a substantial reduction in uh, in the number of mismatches, and that the, the 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 reduction in mismatches increases where these antigens become uh, less immunogenic. Now, the interesting thing about doing a simulation is that you can um, uh, is is that you can also um, look at the actual requests that have come in, in for instance, in, in, in a year's time, and look at the products that have come in in a year's time. And on every day, you had, you had to make this decision on which products to match to which requests. But you can take that full, years of, uh, that full year of uh, requests and, um, and incoming products and say, well, let, let's see if I, if I look back in, and in retrospect, if I could do it ideally, because in retrospect, you can do this matching process in an ideal sense. Um, what is the level of alloy immunization that we could have prevented? So basically that is like doing the process on a day by day basis, but having the ability to look in the, into the future, because you well, you can imagine that uh, uh, that what what matches you make today will influence the ability of matching tomorrow, right? So there is um, something to be gained by having information from the future, and that's exactly what we've done here. So we've we've run our model here in five different runs. We've run our model and looked at the level of alloy immunization that was prevented. But then in hindsight, done, if we would have full information on the, um, on, the, um, on the future requests as well. And those are indicated by these bars here. Um, th these estimates are bars because you can imagine that if you look back for a year and want to evaluate all possible matches um, there is going to be a tremendous amount of, uh, of possibilities. So to, to, to limit the computational time to assess all these, we've made additional assumptions, which would, uh, would allow us to, to make the calculations more, far more efficient. Um, and uh, that's why these, uh, these uh, retrospect retrospective estimates are, are within these bounds rather than, uh, than point estimates. So what you can see is that this online model, that this uh, this day-to-day -day matching of requests versus current inventory, uh, it, it actually performs remarkably well because with hindsight, you, 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 you would have been able to do a better job and it's not that, that much better. So that's a quite an interesting result. Another assessment that that, uh, that we have done in that same uh, in that same area, we've looked at the composition of the uh, the, 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 the gene pool population. So we basically presumed a Caucasian uh, population, a mixture of the, of the Caucasian population, and a population from with uh, descent, and what you can see is that as this um, the second cohort reduces in size, so the the proportion of Caucasian, you can see that it's difficult to um, um, to prevent this. Whereas for the Caucasian, it would expect to be, to be a matching situation. Um, you are able to achieve. 
The nice thing about working with a penalized uh, approach to determine which matches are best is that you can also incorporate uh, uh, preferences for specific patient groups. So we've also done an assessment where we looked at, uh, for instance, uh, for, the, for, uh, for, for a number of antigens that we've said, well, you know, we want to really want to make sure that these patients are being matched for these specific antigens. And then, of course, the, 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 because you incorporate this into the, into the penalties, uh, requests for specific uh, individuals, for specific patients, will be uh, according to the, the capability of the, the given inventory, but it will definitely give preference to, to, uh, to these matches. So this actually works as well. Now we have this, this system that, that actually that works quite well, um, but there is still room for improvement. For instance, these penalties are pretty indirect. As you've seen, we've, we've, we've put down a number of terms in, the, in this equation, and that is what we consider to be an optimal balancing of these different factors. Um, but that is, uh, that is pretty arbitrary in, uh, in, in a sense. Um, we have done some research in, in looking at the relative weighting of these factors, um, but that is, that is not straightforward. Um, um, uh, and also, for instance, the way that we weight the aging of, this, of particular products, um, we've done that now, uh, done that uh, uh, in an identical fashion for every red blood cell type. And you can imagine that for some, some of these products, it doesn't it really, it's, it's indifferent. If it's a very usable product with a very high usability, um, you know, you don't even want to in, uh, incorporate a penalty for, uh, for aging because you know you're, 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 you're always going to be able to use that. So there is a disoptimality there. And um, and how good or how bad it matches will also depend on the actual uh, inventory composition itself. So not only on the red blood cells, but also on the inventory that that the, the current state of the inventory. Um, so we asked ourselves: Is there not a method that allows optimization of of the final objective instead of working with penalties that are basically an indirect way of controlling sort of an ultimate goal? Uh, and we said, well, is it not just possible that we that we just calculate what happens? Because you know, if, if you make a decision of a particular matching for this given inventory, um, uh, then this is what you end up in terms of your uh, of your inventory, and that gets replenished. And uh, but if you make a different choice, uh, you get a different inventory. And for both of these, you can work out what the the likelihood is that it that you get a new inventory. And from there on, you can calculate again what, what, what a given strategy will, will result in. So there, is, you know, there should be a way of, uh, of just calculating what the best way forward would be. Um, but that turns out to be not as easy as you can, uh, can imagine, because if you just look at uh, matching for, for three antigens, so, um, uh, and you'd say, let's say that we have a, a daily demand of 12 products and an inventory size of 60. So that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's not, a, not a big problem, you would, you would say. Uh, but even for this very simple case, the number of combinations of matching um, is in the order of 10 to the 16. So, and then you have to realize that this is just for the, for the single first step but then you would want to evaluate a whole range of stats. So that becomes computationally intractable. And then we sort of realized that, um, that um, th this process of, of managing this inventory uh, is really like playing a game, right? Because the, the game is, uh, I want to do a good a job as possible. So I don't want to lose any products, but I, I, and I want to have as little uh, Alloimmunization in my recipient population. 
Um, but the similarity with, 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 with playing games is, is quite obvious. And, and we all know that uh, the development in, in, in methodology regarding games and gaming strategies has evolved tremendously. So, um, and why is that? That is because of the power of neural networks. And if you translate that to, to the situation that we've just described, this, this inventory management uh, uh, situation, basically, um, what you want is this decision, is this strategy to be able to tell you, well, given that this is my, my inventory and this is what my re particular request looks like, can you tell me, and that would be something this neural net is uh, capable of doing, can you tell me um, how to match these requests in particular? And it's exactly that kind of, um, of um, 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 processes that these neural nets are, ex uh, are extremely well of doing. So given a very variety of inputs, they can have a tremendously complex um, um, uh, way of processing this information to come up with something that we would consider to be an optimal decision. And having good examples helps. If you look at what these people that have developed these, uh, these games do, uh, in some cases, for instance, the, 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 the first round that they had, it, or the first thing they do when they, uh, when they train a model to be able to play chess or play Go, is analyze the games of uh, experts that have played against each other. And so good examples help. And we actually have good examples because um, the analysis that we did, for instance, for, this, um, for the evaluation of the simulation that we did, gives us a lot of information on, on a good strategy for matching which means that we can learn from what to do by just looking at the decisions that are made, train a neural network to recognize what is happening, uh, learning the underlying mechanism and, and helps us telling, telling us what to do in terms of matching given a particular inventory and request. All it requires is that you play this game over and over and over. So, but that is something that computers are extremely capable of doing. So basically you have what they call an agent and an environment and a, um, uh, an action that is, that is the actual matching process. The environment response, so it takes these red blood cells that have been matched, the inventory gets replenished, and at the end of a run, you evaluate how well you've done and you adapt your strategy accordingly. Now, the, the, the benefits over a, a penalty-based method is, is obvious. You, you minimize the overall impact of mismatches and outdated directives. So you're, you're basically controlling the outcome that you want to control instead of an intermediate penalty. Um, but you can optimize more things. You could, you could uh, derive an, opt an optimal ordering strategy for the hospital or go further and, uh, and, and look at the, the whole um, uh, logistics chain and try and optimize that. Um, and even go as far as to include donor invitations. So you, 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 you could go as far as, as develop what what we, what you could what you could call a digital a digital twin of the the whole blood supply chain, and try and model that and, and play that game and try and optimize different processes. Obviously, there are also a number of drawbacks. Um, to train the system, you you do need a lot of historical data. Um, to some extent, you can also simulate that, but historical data is definitely a basis. Um, and it's, uh, it's obviously a black box solution, right? It's the, the, the optimal strategies are always based on this data. So whatever errors are in these data or are in your simulation will also be 
part of the algorithm that you that you develop so, and, and it's a black box so you don't really understand what it does you just can see that it performed very well the biggest uh, that is obviously also one of the drawbacks but the, the, the biggest drawback is obviously also that you, you you're really trained on this uh, on this uh, system that um, that is operational and um, so such a system is probably very bad at handling disruptions so any changes in the system you don't really know up front how robust your system will respond to that uh, so such a situation and hence a backup system would always be required to be in place so i think um, i'm almost there um, uh, so in conclusion i think these penalty based methods uh, work very very well uh, and what's very important that is that they can be tailored to individual patient needs reinforcement learning i think there's a tremendous potential in uh, in, in optimizing further more deeply uh, different processes um, and uh, so it's it's, it's it's a fascinating area that we're entering and being able to to explore that and whilst doing that we also want to make comparisons with uh, robust optimization which are modern uh, uh, operations research methods uh, that are also developed to be uh, to be uh, able to handle uncertain uh, uncertain processes, so stochastic processes, like the um, the incoming demands for uh, requests for specific red blood cells, as well as the uh, the stochasticity in the incoming red blood cells. So this has been quite quite a journey for the past couple of years, and uh, I've been very lucky working with these people. Uh, on this slide here, which on, on the left-hand side is Joost van Sommek, who's been my PhD um, uh, for, for many years. He, and he did his, he finalized his PhD uh, uh, about a year ago. And then we had Ronald van Weyn, uh, who is a, a very, very brilliant uh, master student who, uh, uh, who whom we had the pleasure with of working for the past two years, I think. Uh, Ellen van der Schoot and Marshall van der Haas, who you probably, uh, most of you will know. Mil is our new PhD student on this project. Hank Schoen and Willi Jesse Luke from Sanquin, and of course, uh, our collaborators from the University of Twente and the University of Utrecht, uh, which we have the pleasure of working with. And René Nisse from the, uh, one of the Dutch hospitals in Amsterdam has been pretty vital in making sure that um, that we get uh, good data from hospitals and good input from uh, from their practical point of view, and I think that's um, that's it. Thank you very much, and, and I, I do hope there is some time left for questions. Excellent. Th thanks. Thanks, Mark. Very excellent talk. Very, very interesting and stimulating. There's a lot, 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 lot of ideas and things. So. Uh, so if you have any question, please uh, raise your hand or put those uh, in the chat. And uh, so, Amy, there's already a question there. Great. I've got um, a couple, so I'll start with one and then and then pass over to other people so that we uh, don't take up too much of anyone's time. So um, in terms of our estimation of how these antigens are based in the population at the moment, how much is that potentially impacted by poor mismatching that already exists in blood donation? Or is blood donation sufficiently rare that it's it's not likely that we might have overestimation of how common these antibodies are because we're creating some through blood donation? Did that make sense? Um, well, w one of the things that, 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 that um, one of the things that uh, that we've definitely presumed, and I think that's a, that's a fair assumption, that is that we um, um, that as we don't measure most of the antigens yet, uh, that those will be a proper reflection of what what is actually the the prevalence in the in the general population. Um, but in itself, and and, it, and the same holds for the recipient population. We've we've basically looked at the impact of uh, matching. 
um, with a with a, um, um, a random influx and request of um, of antigens. Um, if that turns out to be biased, it doesn't really matter for the models that we uh, that we develop. But it just means that you uh, you'll get different uh, uh, different bias in the type of requests that you get. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pass to William, and then I might show you back up. <laughs> Thanks. And and Will, yeah, uh, you have a raised hand. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, it tells me I can't stop my video. I'm not sure why. Um, but I just um, was wondering about the, the penalty optimization that you mentioned. Do you do yeah. that um, uh, kind of analytically? Is it possible to calculate the, the optimum analytically, or do you do you need to use some kind of um, stochastic search algorithm to do that? Um, we haven't. We haven't. Um, one of the things we notice is that it it it. it as, as we've shown in the uh, in the comparison with the offline model, uh, you can see that it that that the online model is actually performing quite well, quite well. Uh, but obviously, tweaking these tweaking these numbers will will affect the process. So uh, so if you, for instance, if you increase the penalty for aging, then obviously um, uh, if you if you if you make it less important. You will get outdating of products, and that is uh, and that is so. You'd have to tweak that number until you see that in the process of products that you request, uh, you don't you're not lo you're no longer confronted with with outdating. Um, but obviously, you could look at uh, at optimizing those on uh, on any kind of grid search method. But we haven't done that yet. But it uh, it's something that is quite feasible. Thanks. Because it will help you again understand the impact of these uh, of these different penalty terms. Thanks. But like I said, like I but like I said in the talk, it's 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 always you know it's like a like an imperfect tuning of what you'd actually want to achieve, which is, you know, just just do what works best in the end. And this is your you're just tweaking a number of in between measures such that the end result is pretty good. But I'm quite confident that we can actually uh, get to better results if we uh, if we just let the system train itself on, in doing a better job. Thanks. And before coming back to you, Amy, there's a question on the chat from uh, Follarin. Do you want to to unmute yourself and read your question? Um, I see a question here by uh, Follarin. Indeed, the question is: What what source of disruption events would you anticipate in the supply inventory, uh, and what are their consequences? Um, well, I think we had a, 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 a pretty um, um, nice example of the, co of the COVID pandemic, which, which definitely uh, uh, impacted our blood supply. And uh, it's, it's, it's things like that. As, as soon as something is not the way that you, that you have anticipated, uh, then you can expect uh, uh, a reinforcement-based learning algorithm not to be functioning optimal anymore. And that's also the reason that we that we want to have a backup system in place where we at least know what it's doing and that is that it is doing a good job. So, uh, but that is that is, yeah, one thing that you could uh, you could quite easily uh, imagine of happening. Uh, so, Amy, back to you for another question. <laughs> Um, so I know one of the things that comes up a lot, particularly with sickle cell patients, is going through and having repeated blood donation and developing lots of antibodies. And I was wondering, is the neural net going to be able to like cope with, if nothing else, just estimating the impact of that of better matching? You know, how, how, because it's not just going through once, it's patients going through round and round and round again. Yeah. Um... Well, we're not going to solve that problem by uh, by 
by uh, improving uh, the, the the matching of the products itself. I mean, I, I think that's something that is a, a, a full area of research of its own. Uh, but the results of such a such an assessment, you could probably uh, quite easily incorporate or, and should incorporate in your matching strategy. Whatever information we get on, you know, what works well for patients, you would you would definitely want to incorporate. But you can you can also anticipate that if if the the, the information exchange exchange between hospitals and uh, and the blood bank improves, that you can definitely learn from 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 those processes as well. Thanks. And uh, and any any we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, any additional question from the audience? But if not, uh, you know, Mark, uh, thanks uh, again. Uh, um, unfortunately, we can only do you know, virtual virtual clapping here. But uh, yes. great, great talk, you know, uh, a lot of information. And thanks really for your time. And uh, hope that uh, you all enjoy this one. And uh, we'll come back soon with uh, other seminars. And please have a look as well at the chat with Sarah. Share other information about the previous seminars and, uh, and what the additional information that you can find on our on our website. Great. Thanks a yeah. lot. Smart. Good for them. Thank you. Bye-bye.